Well, good morning. I believe we are live online. Uh, I hope you can join us there. If you will please stand here in the the midst in the sanctuary. Um, a wonderful service, I believe, but I, I will say just buckle up uh, because we uh, you get to see some heavy truths today uh, that it's always always good to be smacked around sometimes, I think, in a good way. Uh, but we are so glad that we can come together and worship. We can worship not just uh, good behavior or, or institutions or somebody we admire, <clears throat> but that we can worship our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come ye sinners, poor and wretched, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus is ready, stands to save you, full of pity and joined with power. And he is able and willing. Ye sinners, poor and wretched, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, joined with power. He is able, he is able. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you, and I want to welcome those who are uh, worshiping with us online. We're always glad to have you connect with us in this way, and uh, we're coming to Jesus. Uh, that is what we've just sung. We come to Jesus because we're needy, and we pray that God would use this time to, uh, to meet those needs that we have, to uh, fill that void in our life, and to uh, just give us the strength we need uh, to go through life. 
There are a couple of announcements I want to call your attention to. Uh, if you got our uh, weekly newsletter in the email, uh, then you know about these two things. But And I want to mention as well, if you're not getting that and would like to, I think there's a form out on the table. Uh, you can just uh, put your name and email on that and drop it in the offering box and uh, we can get you on that list. But I am going to be doing a new members class, uh, something I haven't done in, well, s since uh, before COVID hit struck. And uh, uh, there are actually two parts to this. One is a ministry presentation, uh, which is sort of give you an overview of the church and what we believe God's called us to do here. And uh, that is coming up on Sunday evening, March 14th from 4.30 to 6.00. And then the introduction to Crossgate, which is the a larger part of it, it's a Saturday. It's a Saturday morning uh, from 8.30 to 12.30, uh, and that's April 17th. I've tried that a lot of different ways over the years. I've tried doing it consecutive Sundays, and uh, invariably I found that a uh, few folks would hit this week and miss this week and this, so I said, let's just do it once, hit it hard, and get it behind us. So if you're interested in being a part of uh, these, then let me know so I can be sure and have enough materials available, okay? Well, our call to worship this morning is found from in Hebrews. It says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And we're reminded there, God's interested in the heart. He's looking at the heart. And he wants us to come near to him uh, with a heart that's cleansed from sin, a heart that's sincerely seeking after the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity, for the privilege we have of coming into your presence, into the Holy of Holies, uh, through the blood of Christ. Uh, Lord, we come to acknowledge that you are the only living and true God. And we come to acknowledge the fact that you are great and glorious and there is no one like you. Uh, Father, we want to offer to you our sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving uh, this morning. And Lord, as we come to you, would you really prepare our hearts? Would you cleanse us from sin? Uh, Lord, uh, perhaps things we've done or things left undone. Lord, would you cleanse our hearts from sin uh, that we might come to you with a clear conscience? And Father, I pray that as we draw near to you, you would draw near to us. You would bless us. You would encourage us. Lord, you would strengthen us in the inner man and that we might be the men and women that you want us to be, that we might be holy even as you are holy. And so, Lord, we commit this service to you and we pray that uh, it would just be a refreshing time. Pray that we would leave here today uh, just knowing that we have been in the presence of the living God. We have met with God. And Lord, our lives would be different as a result. So thank you in advance for what you have in store for us and how you will be working in us by your Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, please stand. Thou art our hearts, we bend our knees, O Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things, O Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not souls to another give us clean hands give us pure heart let us not lift our souls to another in god let us be a generation that sees and seeks your faith oh god of jacob and god let us be a generation
us clean hands, give us your heart, let us not lift our souls to another, and God let us be your generation that sees, and seeks your face, oh God of Jacob, and God let us be your generation that sees, and seeks your follow with a confession of sin, um, but I, I think this can also be considered, in a sense, a confession of faith. <clears throat> we believe in one God, one Father, one Holy Spirit. We believe uh, in the virgin birth, all the things of the creeds, but we also, in our faith, believe that we are sinners uh, and that we need salvation. Uh, we also will follow this confession of sin with the glorious hope that we don't are not just stuck in our sinfulness <clears throat> and left there, but that God in his mercy and his grace um, offers our salvation. And so I ask, Christian, what do you believe? Almighty, Almighty God, God, we acknowledge, acknowledge and, and confess that we have, have sinned, sinned against you in thought, thought word, and deed. deed. We, we have, have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We, we have, have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. ourselves. Deepen within us our sorrow for the wrong we have done and the good we have left undone. Lord, you are full of compassion and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. There is also forgiveness with you. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Bind up that which is broken. Give light to our minds, strength to our wills, and rest to our souls. Speak to us and let your word abide with us, working in us your holy will. Amen.
let's gather around the throne of grace this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer. Would you join me? I try you in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we do praise and adore you. We confess that there is no one like you. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, from everlasting to everlasting. You are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Lord, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you are our God. Uh, Father, thank you for your love, which is everlasting. A love that began in eternity. Oh Lord, you've loved us with an everlasting love. You set your affection upon us. You purposed to have a people for yourself. Even before the time began, before there was a world. And Lord, we are so grateful that uh, you have worked in our hearts and lives by your Holy Spirit. That you've drawn us to yourself. That you've given us faith to believe. Lord, that you have given us conviction of sin and, and the spirit of repentance that we might turn from our sin. Oh Lord, you are the God of history. And throughout time, as we look back millennia, throughout the Old Testament, you've been calling people to yourself. Oh Lord, a chosen people, a people for your own possession, a people that you would delight in. And Lord, we... Standing here, 2021, Lord, we're just a part of this redemptive history, the flow of redemption that began in eternity. Thank you for letting us be a part of that. Lord, thank you for your grace that is indeed sufficient. Lord, we experience that grace first when we come to faith in Christ and we are saved. But Lord, I thank you that uh, your grace is sufficient for every need in our lives. And you give a greater grace. Uh, Lord, it's not just once we experience it, that's it. But Lord, every day uh, we get to experience more of your grace in our lives. Uh, but Lord, you call us to walk humbly. You tell us that you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would walk humbly before you. And we would realize that all that we are, that we have nothing to boast of. All that we've received, all that we have, we've received from you. Uh, Lord, that's true of our talents and our abilities, our looks, uh, whatever we have, our families, our heritage. Lord, that's all of you. We have nothing that we can really boast in. But Lord, we can just give thanks to you for how you bless us. Oh Lord, thank you that we can call you Father. Thank you that you love us so much. I thank you that, oh Lord, you have a plan for each of our lives, a unique plan. And Lord, I thank you that every circumstance, every situation that we encounter, every trial that we face, every temptation that we encounter, Lord, all of this is designed by you to draw us in a deeper relationship with you, uh, that we might experience greater intimacy with you. Uh, Father, thank you that, that we can trust you with every single need in our lives. Lord, I pray today that you would, uh, you would minister to each person here, each person that is watching on the internet, Lord, you would minister to needs today. I pray that you would refresh, that you would strengthen, that you would encourage. Uh, Lord, I pray that all our eyes would be focused on our Savior, on Jesus. And Father, I want to pray specifically for Harry today. Lord, you know Harry's in the hospital. And... Harry needs your help, and I pray that you would minister to him. I pray for the doctors, that they would have wisdom as they deal with him. And Father, I pray for Barbara as well, uh, that you would uh, encourage her, uh, that you would uh, just wrap her up in your arms of love and encourage her. 
Father, you're so good. Thank you for being our guide, our Savior, our Father. Lord, we love you. Thank you for what you're going to be doing in this service. Lord, we commit it to you and pray all of this in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's continue to lift up uh, the name of the Lord as we look at uh, Matthew chapter 23 uh, this morning. It's a passage we'll be focused in. Uh, and I know we were in Matthew 21 uh, last week, so you didn't miss a week. Uh, but we're not just wanting to skip over 22. We'll reference uh, things in it as well. So much that is helpful there. But we'll focus in on uh, chapter 23 this morning. I'll just say as we uh, move forward toward uh, Matthew's account of the resurrection. Um, and I, I will um, 
warn you, maybe not a smackdown, um, but Jesus does lay it in to the, to the Pharisees. Maybe it's not a smackdown for you, but Jesus lays, it, uh, lays in to the Pharisees a hard uh, in this passage. And hopefully that is freeing for you. Hopefully it's encouraging uh, to you um, that this is not where Jesus leaves us, but this is what he uh, condemns, that he would lead us to himself and to himself uh, alone. And, and not our own pretended righteousness like you see of the scribes and the Pharisees. But would you, would you pray with me even before we read this chapter together and ask for God's blessing on his word? Well, Lord our God, we do need you uh, to speak to us. Uh, you have the words of truth. You have the words of life. Uh, we are prone to, to run to so many things and to believe the lies that we tell. Uh, Lord, and we pray that you would root all those things out. Uh, that you would help us to see uh, the glory of Jesus. Lord, help me as I uh, read and preach your word, uh, that I would show forth the glory of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. That it's, he is the one whom we need. Lord, we pray that you would give faith, that you would strengthen it, uh, that you would build it up, uh, that you would work uh, through your word in us, transforming us to be more and more uh, like your Son to live the kingdom, to live out, uh, to live within the kingdom that he has, that he has built, that he has established, or that kingdom that will have uh, no end. So Lord, we ask for your grace uh, and your help and your presence with us in the reading and preaching of your word. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, and we'll be looking at the, the whole of the passage. It's kind of one uh, section together of Jesus' uh, teaching uh, Matthew chapter 23, uh, hear the word of God. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do whatever they tell you, but not the words they do, not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their fingers. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their, their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you blind guides who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools! For which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it's nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe, mint, and dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside... They are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murder the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sinners to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. So your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord is forever. So here among us. Well, by the time you get to Matthew 23, uh, you can tell that the gloves are off. Right? Jesus is, is laying to the Pharisees. He's not holding back at all, uh, but calling them to account, uh, calling them uh, in condemnation. Right? Seven times you hear that phrase, woe to you. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, six times hypocrites, pretenders, religious actors. Five times he calls them blind, blind guides, blind fools, blind men. They don't see clearly what the kingdom of God is, what it's about, or what they need. You get the idea that Jesus sees the Pharisees as a problem, and not just a little bit of a problem, but as a major problem that he's calling out, and, and why? Why is that? Why does he spend this much time calling them out so directly? And we need to keep in mind that all of this is in the, the final week leading up to his, his crucifixion. Right? Already at the end of chapter 21, we saw that they were, they were ready to arrest Jesus. They already wanted to get rid of him. He's the problem they've got to deal with. They want to arrest him and get him out. Um, but the people are still very interested in Jesus. Ah, right? They're, they're saying Hosanna to Jesus as he comes in. They're looking to him. And so because of the crowds, they weren't able to just arrest Jesus. So in chapter 22, they take on a different tactic. They decide, they think that maybe they can set a trap for Jesus to fall into. They're going to continue to come with these different challenges and questions, hoping to trap Jesus in saying the wrong thing that will at least kind of turn the crowds against him. So a great one to always get people maybe upset is to talk about taxes, right? So should we pay taxes or not? Should we, should we pay taxes to Caesar? In other words, are you saying that we should be okay with this other authority ruling over us? Are you not really the type of Messiah that's going to deliver us from this? Or if Jesus says, says if he says that, then, then the crowds maybe would turn against him that way. Or if he says, um, if he says on the other side that you sh don't have to pay taxes, well, turn the Romans. He's an insurrectionist. He's trying to call the people away from you, and they've got him trapped either way, they think. Uh, of course, Jesus has the right way to answer all of these uh, challenges that they bring to him about resurrection and, and marriage, about uh, the greatest commandment, and so on. And it ends up with every answer that it kind of exposes where the Pharisees are off. Uh, and then at the very end of that chapter, Jesus asks them a question that they can't answer. Uh, David's son, who is the Messiah, why does he call him Lord? They, they're not willing to touch that because they recognize that people are looking to Jesus as Jesus the Messiah. They can't say that, he's, that he is somehow Lord or they would have to acknowledge and come under him. So it says at the end of chapter 22 that there's no more questions, no more challenges to them uh, against Jesus at that point. You can understand how everything is then very quickly moving toward the crucifixion. 
Right? He is calling out uh, the, the, reigning, the ruling authorities, the religious experts, the religious leaders. He's laying them to task. And you can tell how much this would only move that that much more quickly them finding a way that they've got to overthrow him. They've got to get rid of him because he's undoing everything that they hold uh, sacred and valuable. So here, in this passage, Jesus is calling out the religious leaders. It's, it's condemnation. It's kingdom condemnation as, not being, as be, them being opposed to his, his kingdom. They're the problem. But why? why? What is it about the Pharisees that makes them uh, so much the problem? In other words, I want us to think about the question, uh, what is Jesus against? Right, that we know what Jesus is for, uh, that Jesus is for salvation, that he is for the kingdom of God, that he has come to redeem. But if you're for something or you're, opposed to, you're, you're against the things that are opposed to it, what is Jesus against? And to ask as well, are we, are we against that same thing? Do we consider it as big of a problem as Jesus does? To want that rooted out. Pharisees are the, are the problem he's calling out. But remember the Pharisees were thought of as uh, very well thought of, well respected. They're the religious leaders, those who are admired and honored. They're given the highest place, right, given the uh, seat of honor in these places. They're, they're the disciplined teachers and observers of the law. We're used to just thinking this, because Matthew's taught us the Pharisees are on the wrong side here. But if we were there and just seen it, uh, we would often just think good things about the Pharisees. I want you to see it this way. That Jesus is targeting good people as the problem. Okay? Jesus is targeting uh, good people as the problem. And I mean that, that is good people who are not as good as they say they are. It's the issue with the Pharisees here. That's what Jesus is especially against. More so than prostitutes. More so than tax collectors. Uh, more so than the complacently religious, all of whom he calls into repentance, and, and some of whom come and join part of the kingdom and community that Jesus is building. More so than the Roman overlords more so than the ugliness of Greek idolatry and the surrounding culture around them, all of which need to be called to repentance. But the biggest problem that Jesus points out and the harshest language that Jesus uses is for these religious pretenders, uh, pretending to be uh, better than they are. A brood of vipers, Jesus says. right? The, the nest of poisonous snakes is how he views them. Or he even gives that phrase there uh, earlier on with a proselyte. Uh, you make him twice as much of a child of hell as yourself. Right, that phrase we hear sometimes, a spawn of Satan, is the type of language Jesus is applying here to these good, outwardly looking, religious uh, leaders of his time. Good people, not as good as they say they are. Are we against what Jesus is against? Do we see it as as much of the problem as Jesus, uh, Jesus does? Because here, what is Jesus doing? He's teaching the crowds. He's teaching his disciples. Because a lot of time, if, if the Pharisees come to us and say, hey, you're not doing it right. This is the way to do it better. This is how things are supposed to be. We can have a tendency to be like, oh, okay, I need to follow along with that. Uh, Jesus is helping his people see, no, that is not my kingdom. This is not what is to be in you. Uh, you are to see me as the one who is good and whom you need and be acknowledging that and living as the, like that. We're not to follow or emulate or live like uh, the Pharisees. I think at the same time, we've got to admit as we look at this, at, at this passage that Jesus is, is, often, is also calling us out here as well. Uh, that we often want to pre pretend to. We want to look better than we, than we actually are. Um, I'll admit it, I, I would love to look, I want to look better to you than I actually am. And I don't get too upset if you think about me as better than I am. Probably do too many things and want to tend to that. And I would say, pray for me. <laughs> That's not the way Jesus calls us to. Uh, it's been a, maybe a hard passage to work through this week and a very good passage to work through. Um, but I'm so thankful that Jesus condemns this in my life and says it's not okay. And when it pops up, he says, it needs to be rooted out. And I wouldn't cling to any of those things, but cling to Christ alone. 
But that's what Jesus calls us to. And that pretending to be good on our own without repentance is to pretend to not need Jesus. It's to pretend to not need his crucifixion. It's to pretend to not need his transforming power uh, at work in our life. Right? May it never be that that would be how we would live or what we would hold on to. So let us love what Jesus loves, but also hate what Jesus hates. And Jesus makes clear here that he hates hypocrisy. And we're not to be part of it. Look at it first this way. Uh, good people are as the problem. Just hear me out here, though. They're good people as the problem. Now, obviously, the Pharisees are not actually good people. Right? Jesus draws that out for us. But we need to learn how to recognize that. Because a lot of times what we would do is as we look around at things, as we see outward obedience and different things, that we look and say, oh, this is, this is how we should be. And notice here, even in this passage, that the Pharisees, they do a lot of good things. A lot of helpful things in society, the way we would look at it. Um, but what I want us to do is just kind of walk through and notice, even in this passage where Jesus is calling them out and condemning them, to notice a lot of the good things that he mentions about them. The things that we want to see, right? They teach the Bible. I think that's a good thing. I hope you think that's a good thing. All right, we want to hear actually what God has said was true from his word, and they were those who would teach his word, who would know it and help instruct others in it. Look at verse 4 and say they uh, seems that they don't even avoid talking about the hard things. They want to draw people into all of it. Passage mentions uh, uh, phylacteries and, and the fringes of their garment, which was uh, the phylacteries were these boxes in which they would carry uh, written uh, scriptures that they had memorized and that, would be, that they would wrap around their, their arms in time of prayer. So th the idea is uh, that these are people who memorize scripture, people who are serious about prayer. It's a good thing. I want all of you to memorize scripture. I want you to be serious about prayer. These are, these are good things that we can see within this, right? Uh, they have, we can say they've earned uh, respect and honor uh, from others. Uh, they're, they're given that place of honor for a reason, right? When we look and we know someone, if we're, we're getting to know, we realize the reputation from everyone else that we talk to about this person, that they are committed, a good person, following these things, we tend to accord that same uh, respect and, and honor to him, right? Uh, for, for here, they're even known for being a teacher, you now you might get a nickname for different things or, or what you do somehow. Well, they, these guys are known as rabbi because what they're, what they're so serious about is people knowing God's word. Uh, and so they're the instructors in it. So they're just called a rabbi. Right? They've earned a place of respect and honor. Even when it comes to the woes on uh, verse 13, right? can't we say that they guard the purity of religion? that they require for themselves and for anyone else that would come to it to, to take these things uh, seriously and not lightly. Uh, even when you come to verse 15, right, that they would travel land and sea to make a proselyte. They are committed to missions. I want you all to be committed to missions. They are committed to missions. They will go the distance, travel all of this because they want to see someone be, be discipled, be changed, and come out to this, this way of what they think is right. Uh, they, obviously Jesus calls them out for their view about O's and how that's wrong. Uh, but even within that, you can still tell that they, um, that they take O's seriously. Uh, religious O's are be, to be taken seriously. Not to swear lightly that what you say to God or what you say before God matters. And you, you've got to deal with that. Or verse 23, right, these are significant givers. Uh, these, are, these are strong, generous donors uh, to what's being done. They're the ones who, who keep the lights on, who keep things running because of their diligent commitment to it. And not just in a general way are they tithers, but, but even to the details, tithing, uh, tithing mint and dill and cumin, right? So not just are they tithing off their, their uh, net income or even just off their gross income, but they're looking at the, at, at the value of all the benefits that are included in their job package, and what's the value of that health care and making sure that they pay a tenth even of those things, right? Uh, they're serious givers, uh, significant and generous in this sense. 
We could say that they are um, always presentable, right? Always uh, appropriate and presentable. If you don't want to take my word for it, that these are uh, uh, calling these people good, good, right? From the way we look at them, what does Jesus say about them? Outwardly, they appear righteous. What we, what we see is you just know them, outwardly they appear righteous. They're always uh, appropriate and presentable. It's kind of refreshing though, right? Not everyone is all the time, and sometimes that's so frustrating. Of these people, you can always rely upon them to be given the right, uh, coming across rightly, um, putting their best foot forward. Even goes on and mentions uh, monuments and tombs of the prophets, that these are people who, who remember and respect history who value their ancestors, who want to learn the lessons from the past so that they apply those as they move out toward the future, honoring the good things of the past. <laughs> Listen, you can look at those things from within this passage, and, and don't we want to be like this? And don't we uh, tend to feel better about ourselves when we are more like this, when we can put this uh, presentation to our life? Those are good things. We want those good things. They're not bad things in part, but notice that they are the very things that Jesus highlights when he condemns the scribes and the Pharisees because they're used as a covering. They're used as a covering to hide what's wrong and to hide how deeply wrong it is underneath. They're used to pretend that they're already good enough, uh, that they're not desperately needing salvation, desperately needing some different new way of help uh, from the Lord, that they're not acting as if that they are, they're not living as those who, are, who have no help unless God himself would come uh, in their place and in the flesh uh, for them, suffering the consequences of their failure and open a new and living way to God that they could never make for themselves. That's not what they're trying to say, that they need reconciliation. They're saying, we're, we're on God's side. We're the ones who are doing it right. So when, when Jesus highlights what's most opposed to his kingdom and condemns it, it's good people that are the problem pretending to be better than they are. As good people, say in light of this passage, who will go on to crucify the Messiah, who will go on to kill uh, God's Son, God in the flesh, because He's the one who is messing up the way things are supposed to be. We don't want to be like them. And we don't want to give in to that within us or let that be what shapes uh, the community that belongs to Christ. This is what he condemns. Good people is the problem, but particularly why? Uh, secondly, it's the pretending to be better than they are. It's the pretending to be better that goes in along with all that they are doing that Jesus is exposing here. Now you can look at how Jesus exposes them, maybe how he exposes us as well, as being not as good as, as we want to think. We're not as good as we want to present. Uh, now, I would say, I would expect that for the scribes and the Pharisees that they don't realize that they're pretending. Uh, that's what Jesus called them when he calls them hypocrites, uh, as pretenders, religious actors, putting on uh, one way of, of acting that's not who they really are. I don't think they just knew that they were pretending because they had believed their own lie because they've become enamored with their own uh, good reputation and lived in such a way as to just continue to keep that up. Uh, ultimately, what they're doing is, is pretending that, that Jesus' work is not really all that necessary, or that at best it's just supplemental to what they're already able to do, Right? So what I want to do is go back through a lot of those things that we just saw, those good things, but see how uh, they're used to, to cover over uh, the evil within. Right? Not just the good on the outside, but how we use that uh, to, to hide what's wrong. Right? Don't we often let, uh, he talks about their, their teaching, uh, teaching the Bible, but don't we often use good words to cover over inaction? Right? He says uh, they don't practice what they preach. Great to be up here uh, preaching uh, on this passage. Um, 
Pray for me, help me in that. But you don't just have to be a preacher uh, for, this, uh, for this criticism to be applied to you, right? You may have heard it applied to you or asked some non-Christian friends, whether about you or about others. That part of the thing that bugs them is, yeah, they talk all this good talk. They say all these things, but, the, but I watch the way that they live. I watch how far off that is from it. And then it's so easy for us to feel more comfortable when we know the right answer. And we can say, yeah, this is how things are supposed to be. This is what we should be doing. This is the right thing to do. And then because we can put those right words together, we don't have to worry as much about how, how far off we are from it. Or maybe along with that, uh, don't we often use reputation to hide reality? Because right, the Pharisees aren't actually better uh, than others, right? Paul brings out for us clearly, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But they uh, want to to receive that honor and have that reputation. But gospel growth is always growth in humility. It's not just a growth in feeling better about ourselves. It's a growth in humility. Uh, That's why Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. It involves seeing more and more that we're more uh, broken, more sinful than we wanted to see, that we need Jesus more uh, than we realized that we did. Go a little bit further into the woes as Jesus highlights uh, what they did and how they, uh, yeah, they shut the kingdom to others. But, um, but don't we let sometimes high standards uh, hide or obscure the access to the kingdom? Right? They, they shut another person. They neither go in nor allow anyone else to come in, but because they're trying to say this is how seriously everything's been talked about, but they don't talk about how God calls us to come to him. They don't come to God or show other people how uh, to come to God. Think of a building that's just kind of set for years and the woods have grown up, uh, up around it. Maybe the bushes that have been planted or the ornamental trees that were there have just never been cut back and grown and grown where you can kind of barely see the door. Barely see the door handle because everything's just, just overgrown all around it. That's what they're tending to things as created. Um, right? That uh, How many people today in our culture still think that Christianity is about being a good person? Uh, and, and how many people are not interested in Christianity if that's how it's seen because they think that they're already, well, at least about as good as some of the Christians that they know? Or at least maybe their sins are different, but they're, but they're not obnoxious and proud and, and judgmental the way that they see a lot of these Christians as being. If we let that be the view of what is the access to God is by our goodness, then we are we're destroying that witness of the gospel. Instead, this is to show our wrongs and that we need Christ. Or how about this? We see their traveling land and sea uh, to come, uh, to, come to, to Jesus. Uh, we see their, that commitment to, to missions. Uh, don't we often use evangelism and missions and discipleship uh, to console ourselves, uh, to feel better about ourselves, to convince ourselves that, that we're on God's side and that he needs us because we're, we're contributing to God's work. So we must be good. Uh, how many pastors have said or how many pastors at times feel, feel to ourselves like, well, we're, we're doing God's work, so I know I'm on his side. And Jesus comes along and rips this, this idea that, that he needs us to accomplish his work right out. And I'm thankful for it. Uh, but that he's able to use us is a beautiful and amazing thing. Uh, Jerry Bridges, the author of several uh, books, the first book that he wrote was The Pursuit of Holiness. He went on to, to write uh, Transforming Grace and the Discipline of Grace. But uh, he wrote this book to talk about as we're, as, as that we are called to be disciplined in our dependence upon God and pursuing the holiness that God requires of us and how to go about that in shaping. And it's, a very, it's a very helpful book, as well as his others are after that. But he, the years after he wrote that first book, he came back and said, he realized that that book could also be taken, I'll say, in a very pharisaical direction. You could look at it just in terms of what are these things I can do uh, to, to pursue God more without, the, without an understanding of grace, without an, without an understanding that the only way I'm able to move toward God is Him working within me. It's dependent upon His power and, and not mine. Uh, some of you will know uh, Veggie Tales. Uh, 
Bob the tomato, Larry the cucumber, uh, great uh, stories uh, from Scripture. Uh, Paul Vischer was one of the uh, folks that, uh, that did Veggie Tales, and there's so many encouraging and helpful things from it. Uh, but he also said years later uh, that he realized that, that it mainly focused on teaching folks Christian behavior. Uh, that it was so easily looked at as just moralism. And what he wanted to do and has gone on to do some is to help uh, kids as well see themselves in light of the big picture of what all God's doing on how it's focused in Jesus and how we need him, not just the right behavior for things. Or my mom used to talk about the, uh, the Andy Griffith Show. Don't you love the Andy Griffith Show? They start whistling at the beginning, and I just kind of relax. I want to sit down and take a few minutes. i watch Andy and Opie Taylor down there fishing and throwing some rocks across the stream and just, just you know, feel good uh, moments to all of it. Um, and there's so much that's good and it's helpful in those shows. And they don't just pretend like everything is right. Opie lies about something, someone else cheats about this, you know, and it deals with how you deal with some of these wrong things. And after sitting down to a good meal of Aunt B's cooking, right, and a good heart-to-heart -heart of father and son talking through these things, they realize the right way to work it out. And my mom pointed out to us that she says, okay, they offer all this, that this is the picture of, of, of the way we want life to be but without any mention of God in it without any acknowledgement of the need for Christ to come and die for us, of, the, of Christ's atoning death reconciling us to God. It's not there at all. And so we start to believe that we can have this kind of Father's knows best our life of things all going well without God, without Christ at all, without the gospel. And we start to believe those lies. And that we can feel better as we start to talk about these things being done rightly and not see where we're, where we're blind. Right, Jesus calls them blind guides, blind men, blind uh, fools as they uh, teach these things. That we can be blind because we keep our eyes closed to the things that we don't want to see. Right, the blind leading the blind and, and both fall into a pit, Jesus says. There's things that we want to say, well, that doesn't really count as being bad. It's not, it's not as bad as these other things. We have certain exceptions. We're, we're blinded by our rationalizations, our justifications, our refined definitions and exclusions and allowable exceptions. Uh, here, right, it's this context of, of oaths and swearing. Maybe you could take it and apply in, in our society, at least in some sense, uh, to, uh, to swearing, uh, to swear words, right? There are some words uh, that we think of as so bad that if I were to say them, I uh, hear from the pulpit, you would drive me out of the sanctuary. But there's plenty of synonyms to those words. We act like they're, they're just fine. Uh, or there starts to be this kind of Christianese way of just uh, referring with letters to those words or writing them without all the letters in it. <laughs> um, and maybe someone could come and say, all right, which matters more, which is greater, uh, the sound, the spelling of the word, or, or the meaning that's behind it? But to one thing we say, that's really bad, and to the other thing we don't see anything bad. Right? You can see our standards are skewed in very similar ways to, uh, the, to the uh, Pharisees here. Uh, you can imagine talking to a friend or hearing someone talking to you or overhearing them talking to a friend that they, they heard Jack just cussing like a sailor. The foul mouth things that were coming out from him, I would never use inappropriate language like that uh, or gossip or slander to speak about someone that was doing it. Now you see that, right? The, uh, the, the way that we can so easily just blind ourselves looking only at one thing. We often feel better about ourselves for what we avoid. Or we feel better about ourselves for focusing on the, the good details, right? Here they're tithing uh, mint and, and cumin, right? They're, they become self-congratulatory. When you can't tell the difference between a gnat and a camel, something's gone wrong. We don't want to fall into that. Uh, but how often has generous giving become a substitute for generous living? We've made our donations here, and so now we don't have to, have to worry about it. Micah 6.8 says, well, what does God require of us but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God? Right? The weightier matters of the law, some things are more important than others. And we tend to think that we pick the wrong things. Um, 
that we neglect the obvious hard things by performing the more obscure, uh, easier things. When it comes to things like racism or abortion or human trafficking, uh, homelessness and poverty, addiction, uh, abuse, absent fathers, all these things, it's overwhelming. And you don't move into it and just feel like, oh, look, I fixed it. I can feel better about myself now. I solved these problems. No, but the more you move into it, the more you see the layers are just thick uh, down with how much there's, that, you, that, that only by God's grace and his help and wisdom beyond ourselves can those things be gradually changed more and more. Uh, can, it, it takes him to work the good in that, and we don't just feel good about ourselves for entering into it. Uh, that we're called uh, to enter into it. What are, the, what are our gnats that we don't notice, and what are our, what are our camels? Jesus talks about the difference between that outward, what's true on the outside of the cup and on the inside of the cup, that outward conformity uh, that we can so often use as a cover uh, for inward deformity, for what's wrong on the inside, a whitewashed tomb. Don't we hide sexual addiction or hide depression or uh, hide whatever it is that doesn't fit with the right image of what's socially acceptable, what's societally appropriate? But then not only that, but we go on and we believe that the outward presentation that we give is an accurate representation of what's true on the inside. We let the one stand for the other, right? And just in the way that we don't, you don't just dress outwardly the way that you may feel on the inside. You want to dress in a way that, that, that presents yourself well to others. But when we start believing that, hey, this, if we're looking good, that then we are good all on the inside. And we do that morally and spiritually. Uh, we're covering over what's actually wrong. We hide, when we hide sin from one another, then it just becomes self-perpetuating. Right? That if... If, if everything's good with you, everything's fine with you, you're not struggling with anything, then, well, yeah, me neither. <laughs> right? And it's harder for the next person to, to also open up and be real, uh, real back. How does, how does Jesus see them here? He talks about them being full of greed. Outside, things look right, but what's on the inside? They're, they're full of greed, full of self-indulgence. The way they're living is really to have life be happier and more fulfilling and, and go the way they want it to. They're living for things to feel better for themselves. It goes on and says they're, they're full of hypocrisy. They're full of lies and pretending. Uh, and lastly, it says they're full of lawlessness. That's like... That's, that's not the, the, the hook punch coming around from the side. <laughs> that, that's the straight-in-the-face punch. Uh, that they want to pretend that they're the ones who follow the law. He says, you know what? You are full of lawlessness. As we said before, your heart is far from me, not looking to, to follow but to hide. With those monuments and, and uh, glorifying the tombs, they glorify the past. They, they pretend that they would have done right, that they would be on the right side of history, this revisionist uh, mindset, when they've always been against God's message, against God's uh, messenger. Listen, Jesus doesn't want our, our best acting. He's not looking for the best uh, presentation of ourselves. He doesn't just want our, our best performance of as good as we can put on uh, for him. Put it this way, that, that Jesus doesn't love the ideal you. He doesn't love the fake you that tries to do everything right, that gets other people to believe that you're, that you're doing pretty well or a pretty good person, because that you doesn't exist. That's not who he comes. In fact, that's opposed to him. That's the one that's saying Jesus isn't needed and Jesus is, isn't who, we, who we're looking to with things. Uh, that's the lie that he condemns as being a, against the gospel. When we try our best performance, we're actually making things worse. Uh, contradicting the gospel and drawing condemnation on ourselves. So when we feel like we're doing well or we're enjoying other people thinking that about us, we need to tell ourselves, whoa, stop, right? Call ourselves back to this passage and read the woes that Jesus says to the Pharisees, that he would root that out of us, that we would look to his goodness and his goodness alone. But ultimately behind all of that, there's an unwillingness to need Jesus, 
the good people as, as the problem because what's underlying that is just pretending to be better and that pretending to be better always involves a not needing Jesus, not wanting Jesus, wanting to be able to do things on our own. But the good news, we can say Jesus doesn't want the ideal you, but he wants the real you. Uh, warts and all, as they say, that while we were still sinners, a Christ died for us, knowing that darkness of our hearts. Look at verses 37 and 39 at the end here. The gospel is not that we are good, but that God has come uh, to us in the name of the Lord. And it's, a, it's amazing to hear uh, the love and the longing from Jesus' words. Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the compassion that he has, the care and the, the longing, even the imagery that he uses as a, as a mother hen with her baby chicks just wanting to gather them to, him, to herself, a loving them, protecting them, providing to them. That's the way he thinks of Jerusalem. And the issue is that they were not willing, that they would not. Not willing to be needy, not willing to be wrong, not willing to hear God's message. And now, aiming to kill God's Son. Aiming to kill the Messiah. Because he didn't seem to them to be, even though he comes in the name of the Lord, he didn't seem to them to be a blessing. He seemed to them to be a curse who is messing up the right way, the settled way that things were, where they had a good reputation and a good presentation and others value him, and he's messing it all up. And they want to get rid of him. That's where the heart of Pharisaism always goes. Pushing Jesus out of our life. Turning away from him. Uh, going against uh, him. I didn't see a blessing of one coming in the, in the Lord. But the gospel calls us to turn from ourselves. Even to turn from our own uh, goodness or any resting in it. And I'm so thankful that the followers of Jesus not only include... Uh, Matthew, the former tax collector, uh, writing to us here, uh, but also Paul, the former Pharisee, the heart changed and transformed by God and devoted uh, to the gospel. Uh, Paul, whose harshest language also comes toward this same mindset because he knows how harmful it is, how much it's opposed to the kingdom. And we don't want to have any part in it. And when you see it in me, I want you to call it out in me. And when you see it in one another, we need to speak to one another lovingly and kindly and gently, uh, but still firmly and clearly to say, that's not the way. That's not what Jesus uh, calls us to. We're called to admit how much we need him and that he is our only hope and not put up things that would seem to, to, to push that the other way. Pharisees can be great for, for upholding the church, for, for continuing to give, for making things go strong. They can make great leaders in all of these different things. Uh, but no, Jesus calls out not strength from ourselves, not righteousness from ourselves, but recognizing that he is the one who is alone righteous, who has all we need. That we, are the, that we would look and say, as Jesus says at the end of this passage, how blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Look upon Christ coming with all the way that it switches things from what we want and makes it hard and out the way it continues to humble us and break down what we want to rely on is this good presentation. And we say, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord that it frees me from it being about me or what I could ever put together because he has done so much more and that he has done all uh, that we need. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Pretenders will be condemned. Especially those who are good at it, Jesus says. And we shouldn't be those who honor them either. But those who look and say, Blessed is Christ who comes in the name of the Lord, who says all who call upon him will be saved. That he brings salvation even uh, from ourselves. Would you pray with me? Lord our God, we pray that you would help us uh, call out to you from our hearts uh, that you are the one who brings salvation. We would call out, blessed are you who come in the name of the Lord because we need your help. 
And we need it more so than we want to admit to ourselves. We want other people to be able to see, but Lord, you know that we need it. Uh, So Lord, we pray even that you would ransack our lives and leave none of our own self-righteousness left, uh, but that we would cling to Jesus and to his perfect righteousness only and wholly. As Lord, you are a great God. And the salvation that you have worked is incredible. And we need your grace. We need your uh, transforming power at work in our lives that you would conform us more and more to the image of your Son. And it is only your strength and your grace that can do it. Lord, we thank you that your church and your people is not like the Pharisees. And so we pray that you would make us not like the Pharisees, Ah, but like our glorious and gracious Lord, who has brought salvation to all who call upon him. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Stand as we close. that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and our God uh, is also the one who blesses us and whom we rely on by faith. And so I now receive God's blessing on his people. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, be with you all now and forever. Amen.